confused. Oh, there we go. Hello. Hello, um, welcome to our webinar. Hang on, Phil, um, give it a second. I think there's some people still coming in, so. Can you see who's coming in? I can't really see. Yeah, there, the oh, people the are coming in, they're going up, the numbers are still going up, so I'll tell okay, you when, we'll wait, when it we'll pauses. wait till it looks like yeah. it's leveled off. Hello, everybody. We're just waiting for everybody to come in. Okay, the numbers seem to be relatively stable now. So if you want to yeah. crack on, I'll pass over to Phil. He'll be dealing with the first half of the webinar. So, yes, hello. So, um, so we're going to divide this in two, uh, and the goal is that we'll each talk for about forty-five minutes, um, uh, and then you know we can uh, after that have them for discussions. I think that's right, Michael. You don't think we should do discussions one after the other i think we'll do we'll do everything um you can put questions in chat um if you want to uh, ask things as we go along um so yeah so i'm going to be dealing with disrepair in general and uh with the fitness for human habitation um provisions and the paper it hasn't been drafted by me. It's been drafted by my colleague Martin, uh, Martin Hodgson, and it, it sort of deals with a whole range of practical uh, issues that may come up in uh, these claims. Uh, after that, Michael will tackle environmental protection uh, prosecutions. He's uh, had lots of experience of EPA prosecutions, and so we'll have these two sides uh, first, me then him. So um, if I then turn to uh, my bit, uh, and um, there's no particular sequence or order to the issues that are being tackled with. I'm following the order in the paper that's been sent out. Hopefully you will have had that. And if not, um, send uh, an email or a comment in chat and we'll get one sent to you. So uh, the first bit, which I suppose in some ways actually comes at the end, of the claim is, is the question of damages. Well, I say that it, it's quite important to have a, 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 you know, a rough sense of the value of a claim early on, uh, particularly if uh, it's a counterclaim, because you need to obviously understand what the impact of any set off will be on on the claim for possession. So, um, as I say, this paper is drafted by my colleague Martin, who's been uh, doing this work for. Uh, you know, a very long time. And you'll see there's quite a lot of um, historical perspective in this paper. So uh, it, um, it talks about the approach that used to be taken really before, before I did much of this kind of law at all, uh, before the case of um, Shine and English Churches Housing Group. Uh, at that time, there'd be a global award. Um, and at that time also, because of that, um, it was probably more important to have comparative comparatives from other cases because uh, there'd be a common expectation that a particular kind of level of disrepair would correlate to a particular level of damages. But now, invariably, uh, the courts approach this as a as a claim for diminu diminution of rent. So the starting point for any kind of idea at all of what the levels of um, damages are likely to be is a knowledge about what the uh what the level of um rent what the rent what the rent is because uh, it's only then that you can start to, to think about how far the rent should be reduced uh, because of the disrepair and obviously um that makes sense from a logical point of view you've got a claim in contract and the position of any kind of contractual damages is to put you back into the position you would have been in had the breach not taken place and you're paying rent as your consideration for the landlord carrying out their duties so you know from a contractual law point of view it's got an impeccable logic the, the oddity of course is that 
you know, some tenants uh, in social housing pay very low rents, so they will generally get far less in terms of damages. And tenants paying uh, in private rented accommodation for similar kinds of disrepair, you know, if they're paying two or three times the rent, they will look to recover two or three times the damages. Um, and in the paper, uh, Martin points out that um, there's a there's a third category of cases, which is um, where you've got a long leasehold. So you might have a peppercorn rent of 250 pounds a year, um, but nevertheless, the freeholder will um, have obligations towards you. In that kind of case, um, there's no uh, there's no uh, sort of a diminution of the actual rent. There's a dimin diminution of whatever the notional open market uh, rental value would be. Um, so that's the, the the basic approach that that's taken. But then, you know, how do you know? So you you meet your your client. You meet your client. They complain about you know a list of of problems with the property. Is that you know worth ten percent of the the rent? Twenty five percent? 75% of the rent, how, how can you um, assess that? And sometimes um, there's an idea that there's some kind of science to this that, you know, barristers can, can look at it and work it out. But, but really, it, it, it depends. It's, it's, there, there's no science at all, really. Uh, I mean, Martin suggests one approach which uh, is common, which is you can look at what portion of the property is actually affected. So, you know, if you're affected by, you know, a, you know, a bit of damp in a corner of one room, and that the property's got three rooms, then you you can start from the presumption that, um, uh, you know, that the, the the level of damage is going to only really be very small. Whereas if a problem pervades the whole house, it it's much more significant. Um, but even there, I mean, if a if if a room is is completely unusable, let's say you've got three rooms and one room is completely unusable because you know the damp's so bad that no one can go in there. You just close the door if if damp is a problem. That's quite easy. You can say, well, there's three rooms, and you, you know the amount of floor space if they're roughly equal, you know, it's a third of the value of the property is lost. But um, you know, it's very rare for problems to be as kick for um disrepair to be as confined in that way in a clear-cut way so um really uh you're back to just uh you know pulling numbers out of a hat and, and you can look at other cases for assistance um and they're reported in lag they're of limited use and often there, there's not even well sometimes there's not even especially with older cases uh, reference to the actual rental, so you don't know what percentage of the rent is um, is being considered, and, and in those cases, it's very hard to use those cases at all. Um, so, a lot turns in um, damages, in general damages, on the quality of evidence of the effect of the uh, disrepair, and that's something which is often um, in my experience, you know, insufficiently particularized. Um, uh, you know, if I'm drafting um, claims or counterclaims, often there's not enough detail of, well, well three things. I was going to say, I'll go on to address them, but the, the, the causation of whatever the disrepair, the, the causation of any problems uh, in relate that the um, causation of problems uh, arising from disrepair. The causation um, uh, notice is often uh, not adequately uh, particularized, so we don't get enough information about what it is at the beginning of the case. And the effect on the client, and the effect on the client is very significant. Um, you know, how is how has their family life been affected? If it's a family, or how if it's an individual, how has that person's life been affected? How is their health? Been affected. What are their feelings about the um, the uh, disrepair? Um, you know, do they have to make any adaptations to how they normally live in order to to have workarounds? You know, jumping out of the shower to repressurize the the boiler or whatever it may be. Um, 
all of this uh, fine detail um, really makes a difference when you're um, trying to uh, get damages for disrepair, and, and it's very important to put in. I'm just going to have a quick look if there's any uh, questions in chat now. Um, uh, can I just say, Michael, if you keep an eye on what's in chat, and if there's anything that seems, you know, directly pertinent to something I'm saying, if you can just give me an alert, so because you know, then, then it'll save me from having to. Look. Already doing it, Phil. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, so, um, I think um, I better move on. I'm not going to talk about negligence, other than to say uh, it doesn't. Oddly, it doesn't apply. Um, effectively, it doesn't make any difference that it doesn't apply because there are parallel obligations that achieve the same uh, effect in, well, Section 4 of the Defective Premises Act, Section 11 of the Landlord Tenant Act, and now in the new, uh, if we're talking about a hazard, uh, then in the new uh, Fitness for Human Habitation um, provisions. Um, so there's a uh, comment in the, um, or a reference in the uh, paper to mitigation of loss. So sometimes you may have a case where, I mean, you know, thinking about this, it, it may be uh, mitigation of loss. It, uh, the, the particular example given here is access, where a landlord uh, doesn't let, uh, where a, a tenant won't let um, people in to carry out the works. Or, I mean, I've had cases, for example, where tenants, um, you know, slow down the work. They, they may insist on certain things being done in certain ways. They may um, say that they don't want them happening just now. They want certain, um, you know, particular um, bespoke uh, variations to the works put in place. Um, so the principles there are that. Um, it's a defendant that has to show that there's a failure to mitigate loss. And the courts are pretty generous to um, generous to the claimants in, in, in that case, because then if, if someone if the if the problem has been caused by the landlord, um, and unless the tenant's being really unreasonable, um, they're not going to jump up and down and blame the problem on the on the tenant. Um, but in relation to the concrete problem of access, which, which is given here, and you know where it's a question of access before the claim has actually crystallised, arguably there's no claim at all. It's not just simply a, a failure to mitigate. It's uh, you know the landlord hasn't yet breached their duty. They, if they've done everything they can to try and you know carry out repairs, and and they're prevented from doing so. Um, but um, in relation to access, it is very important to drill into clients that they must uh, let the landlord in to do works. Sometimes, in my experience, especially once they've got a solicitor involved, um, they say, "Oh no, 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 you can't come in. You have to talk to my, you have to talk to my lawyer. Um, I'm not letting you in until the lawyer says." So. I mean, that's okay if the lawyer then says, "Yes, let them in," and, and they go straight in. But um, any kind of um, resistance by the tenant to uh, the landlord getting on with the works will often be cited then back as a as a as a problem in in any subsequent litigation. Um, special damages um, often here um, the problem is well there can be a problem of exaggeration. And there can be a problem of um, evidence. So one way to think of it is that you know what's really useful is you know as far as possible to have a table. You have the item. You prove you, you, the item, the proof that you ever possessed it in the first place, uh, the proof that it was damaged or lost, and then proof of the value. Um, so the value is the second hand. Uh, value of something where there's a second-hand market and um, since the internet unfortunately perhaps the, uh, some of our clients there are there are a lot of second-hand markets second-hand markets for all kinds of things um, and you know it's quite easy to find the second-hand value of things I had a, a client whose 
entire record collection was, he said, destroyed by the um, by uh, contaminated waste. And he actually went through every single record and found the secondhand retail value of that record uh, and put it uh, in a schedule of evidence, which, you know, obviously is 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 very compelling. Um, so proof of proof of those four things that you possessed it or those three things that you possessed it, that it was damaged and what it's worth are, are important for any special damages claim. Um, so um, then, um, in relation to disrepair claim, I can see. Just pause to interrupt yeah. you there, Phil. There was just a quick query about um, you were talking about access yeah. before, um, and how that correlates with um, yeah, a situation where expert. essentially you might you're getting your expert and losing yeah, evidence. I can see that. Yeah, well, uh, that's a good question. I mean, I guess at that point you just have a decision to make. That's that that's a, that is reasonable. Um, you you will be in breach of your tenancy agreement if you stop the landlord doing work, um, and I guess it depends partly on what the um, what the problem is, um, whether effectively um, whether whether the whether the damage may be. I mean, it, it may be, it depends, yeah, I don't know. It depends. It's hard to think off the top of my head of a practical situation. You do want an expert report. I mean, if if work's carried out, um, yeah, maybe photo photographing things could could preserve evidence. I don't know. I mean, I think you just have to think. I mean, it a lot depends on how long it'll be till the expert gets in, how long you're going to have to keep the landlord out. Um, you know, you don't want a situation where the landlord is going to court to get injunctions against you because that's really not going to help your case in the eye of the courts. Um, I, I think I agree with you, Phil, that it's a, um, the, sorry to interrupt, but yeah, I, it just, I feel it is very subjective to the case about yeah. how quite what the nature of the disrepair is. Is it something yeah. that you can just take some photos of and get an expert to comment on? You may, if if you have good contacts with a particular expert, you may be able to send them some photos and say, look, do yeah. you need to get in now to be able to assist us? Or can you comment on the photos and then come and look at the property even after works have been done? Um, and it may well be that you have to get your, ex get your expert moving earlier possibly even without permission of the courts, if, if it's a scenario where you want the expert in, but you also don't want to stop their works too quickly. And that may be in discussion with appropriate discussions with the other side at that juncture as well. You may be saying to them, look, yeah. you know, there's a conflict here. We need the evidence, but equally, we don't want to be in breach of our conditions. So um, as long as you're not going to take issue, we'll get our expert in quickly and you can then get on with your works quickly and, and such like. So, yeah. and um, I mean, there may also be scope for, uh, you know, for example, I had a case where the question was what was inside the roof and it sort of makes sense to have your expert attending at the time that they're actually taking off the roof and looking at it because then, you know, the, you, you can, um, they can both look at it at the same time and see what's actually causing the problem. Um, yeah. There is another question as well um, that goes back to what we're dealing with at the start about um, calculation of damages. Um, the question is, if a property is unfit for human habitation, could you potentially get damages for 100% of the rent? Um, I said that to you the other yeah, day. Yeah, you, you actually asked me that question on the, on the yeah, phone. Yeah, that's what they? I thought. That was my instinct. <laughs> that was my instinct. And, and then um, Michael said, oh, you can't find anyone else that thinks that. Um, or he, he, he thought that the, uh, yeah, that was my instinct. My instinct was, yeah, you know, it's a total consideration. You know, yeah. th 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 this is not a place that a human being should be. How can uh, you get anything less than 100%? But, um, well, there's no case law on this. Uh, yeah. it, the thing is, is it, that's the kind of argument which I think could probably be screwed up really badly if... Um, the wrong case if it was the point was made on the wrong case but um it's it's you know it might it might well still be arguable i mean i think i think um i think my my view was it's a contractual term and it's about remedying you for the that breach of that contractual term and the fact that the property 
is um, is part of, for example, yeah, as um, one of the participants says, if part of the property is unfit for human habitation, but the less, rest of it isn't, then you're not going to get your 100%. If it's throughout the property, then you might, it, there could well be an arguable point. Um, it's certainly something that, that I haven't seen tested yet, but that should be tested and, and isn't, it isn't a crazy suggestion. The, the only, and certainly if you're in a contested case, it's worth running the argument where you think it has merit. Um, and I think it's more likely that 100% cases may arise than previously did with disrepair. But um, I'm not necessarily sure it, it's, it kind of applies across the board is what I'm thinking, but um, we're in a situation where this hasn't been really tested yet. With, I, I appreciate the the provision's been around since 2019 now, but we haven't had much no. <laughs> housing law in the court since then. So, no. um, so certainly worth. I, I think it's worth a punt. The only difficulty is in the con certain contexts where you're thinking about settling a case. Uh, um, I, I think you're going to end up reverting back to old measures until you've got something that that, that assists you in settling it on on higher terms if you can do. So um, there we go. That would be yeah. my view. Sorry for that, yeah. are you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, just on that concrete uh, question, Rachel, um, I mean, I think the, I don't think, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I've not seen a, a report by a, an expert where they say this room is not fit for human habitation, but the legislation as a whole isn't organized like that. You know, the implied term is um, in relation to the premises as a whole. But um, we'll go on to that. Um, so just in relation then to um, causation. So, um, and again, this is something that may become less significant the more it's possible to rely on the uh, section 9A, the, the new, uh, well, it's not that new now, but the fitness for human habitation provision. But um, this is another thing that I think um, it's just a suggestion in relation to, you know, when you first meet the client uh, and you're looking at um, what information to gather, uh, you know, at that initial point uh, for the purpose of, you know, pleadings being drafted or, uh, you know, a claim being put in or a uh, counterclaim. And um, I think it, it is really important to think not just about, um, you know, what is wrong with the property, but um, to think about causation uh, in relation to, uh, so you're not just describing what's wrong, what's unpleasant about the property, but how is that a breach of a repairing obligation? You know, it, it, when we're thinking about this repair. Um, and there's two examples in the notes. One is in relation to infestation, uh, which is at the end of the, the paper. And the other is, is in relation to um, damp. So in relation to infestation, uh, and again, this may become less, or this is, is now less important because infestation, it can be a hazard under the, uh, that basically makes property unfit for human habitation. But in relation to um, uh, damp, it's, it's really helpful to uh, try and understand a little bit. You don't have to be a, a surveyor or a building expert, but you can ask a few questions that can open up possible causes of the uh, damp. So, you know, just, you know, what kind of, what kind of a building is it? And, and how, does, how does the property, where is the property damp and what might be causing it? You know, so, um, you know, is it worse after it rains? Uh, when you look outside on the wall where it's, you know, where there's, you know, mold growing on the inside, is it in fact the case that, you know, there's lots of moss all up the side of the wall and a gutter that's spewing over down the side of the wall? Um, is it, um, is there, uh, you know, is there damp that exists at a low level but not at a higher level? And, um, you know, and there's a sort of a salt mark sort of halfway up the wall where there might be rising damp. So, it, I mean, if you can have any kind of you know, basic questions that give you a feel for what's causing the damp. If, if, if we're talking about condensation damp, you know, ask about trickle vents, ask about um, uh, fans, you know, whether there's extractor fans, whether they're working, whether they look like they're working, these kinds of things, because it's much more helpful at the time you're putting in pleadings, but, you know, before the surveyors got there, 
if you can at least identify things that suggest this is, um, you know, that any damp is caused by disrepair rather than just, you know, it's just the property is damp. So I'm sort of conscious that I'm slightly running out of time. So I want to move on to um, dealing with the um, provisions in relation to fitness for human habitation. So, um, so as, as Michael said, there's not much case law on this yet. So we don't know yet how the courts are going to deal with this stuff. But um, I'm going to try and uh, share my screen now. OK. So um, right, so this is the term for uh, this, these are the provisions for uh, fitness for human habitation. Um, and you need to have a look at section 10. Because um, the fitness of human habitation, this disqualifies section 9A. It should be regarded as unfit for ha human habitation if and only if it is so far defective in one or more of these matters is not reasonably suitable for occupation in that condition. And so the matters are repair, stability, freedom from damp. Well, you can read them. Um, and then in relation to any a dwelling in England, any prescribed hazard. Um, some of these are obvious, so you know, damps are obvious. Um, stability would be interesting. I wonder what a, an unstable uh, an unstable property might be. But um, anyway, so you, the next thing you need to then look at uh, is the um, the prescribed hazards. And the list of prescribed hazards, I think, uh, I believe that Michael sent them out. They're all um, to be found in Schedule 1 of the um, Housing Health and Safety Rating System regulations. Um, and again, you look down that list, there's lots of, you know, fairly unsurprising uh, things there. Um, But these these are the things which you need to show. These are the, the, the issues which need to arise. And then um, hazard uh, is just something that um, may uh, mean there's a risk to, to risk of harm to someone uh, using the property. Um, so. Um, Sorry, a risk risk of, of harm as a result, which arises from a deficiency. Um, now, the exceptions or the exclusions uh, are probably where the case law will become interesting. Um, and these are some of the exclusions. So, uh, look here: the implied covenant won't be taken as requiring less to carry out any works or repairs for which the, the tenant is liable by virtue of the, the, their duty to use the premises in a tenant-like manner. I mean, that, uh, and then there's other exceptions for where they can't get permission from uh, landlords, from superior landlords, like freeholders, for example, or a council or some other body, or where they would have to break the law to do it, or if the whole place has been completely devastated by effectively some kind of natural disaster. Um, but um, there's, in relation to this question of um, a duty to use the premises in a tenant-like manner, I think um, at that point, it's maybe useful to uh, think about the concrete question of condensation as a way of um, as a way of thinking about this. Um, now, interestingly, there was a very uh, useful um, report by the housing ombudsman um, last year. Spotlight on damp and mold. It's not lifestyle. Um, and I think this may be very helpful to uh, 
to tenants where there's condensation there and the landlord says, oh, it's the tenant's fault. You, you're not, you know, it's, it's the way you're living. Uh, you're, um, you're not opening the windows. You're not heating the place properly. You put all your clothes on the radiators and uh, that's what's causing the uh, damp and mold. And there are lots of uh, helpful um, points uh, which the housing ombudsman makes in their report and you know, particular landlords that they highlight in particular complaints. But um, this, this comment, for example, I think is quite useful. In, in, this is the ombudsman says, I, I hope the word lifestyle, when it may be a consequence of limited choices, is banished from the, the vernacular. Um, and Arguably, the duty to use the premises in a tenant-like manner. I think there's, there's there must be possible arguments there. Um, you know, the land, what the what the ombudsman points out is that where where someone has no choice in the matter. So, for example, I mean, the two obvious things that come to mind are fuel poverty and overcrowding. Um, and there may well be arguments that, um, you know, if, if, if a tenant, um, you know, they have children, they're doing everything they can to move into bigger accommodation, but none's offered to them, none's available to them, they can't afford any. Um, is that a, a breach of a duty to act in a tenant-like manner? Um, I mean, it would seem a bit unfair because to, to breach a duty, you know, you might, expect that you'd have the that that would be a choice if, if there's no choice can there really be um a breach of a duty that that would be i suppose an argument that would be interesting to see how the how it develops and how, how the courts approach it um having said that it will be or it is you know it is critical in well whether whether um section 9a cases or other disrepair cases it is crucial to um really get across to tenants early on, uh, you know, what condensation damp means, and to stress to them that, you know, it would be really helpful if they don't um, dry their clothes on the radiators as far as possible. They make sure that any trickle vents are open or any other, use any other ventilation, make sure they turn on the um, extractor fan and, um, you know, adopt all of the, you know, do everything that the landlord um, will highlight. Because um, if they're doing that and there's still condensation damp, then on the face of it, you know, there's a much stronger case that um, the thing that needs to change is, is how the landlord approaches it, not how the tenant needs to approach it. I mean, obviously, if it's something they can't, haven't got any control over, like you know, they can't realistically chuck half of the household out on the street or they can't um, you know, heat the property if they literally can't afford it. But things that are within their power to do, um, as far as possible, they should indeed be doing. Um, so, uh, what next? Let me, I can't see anyone now. Uh, um, can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Um, Rachel has posed a question, which is okay. in relation to a fitness for habitation. I think you're going to be coming up to a point anyway, but um, she says it seems to be a difficulty with fitness that the property is either fit or unfit and not on a scale of severity in the way that disrepair matters are. If, for example, there's no disrepair, but there is some level of mould and there could be improvements, for example, installing um, vents, fans, etc. but it's not so bad it is entirely unfit, then it seems the fitness provisions don't really get you anywhere. Um, well Yes. Well, I mean, I'd have thought that the thing there is, um, you know, this is where it's going to turn on expert evidence and it's going to be expert evidence from uh, someone who, uh, you know, is experienced in environmental health, probably, because um, you're going to need a, a you're going to need a report from an expert, someone with with some kind of environmental health expertise who can basically make that decision, because, yes, you have to. There has to be some kind of hazard, but you know, obviously, there's spectrum. You could have, you know, a little bit of damp or a lot of damp, and there's a cutoff. And someone has to say, well, yes, but this actually is not just 
you know, a, a, a minor problem. At this level, these premises are not fit for habitation. Um, and that is something which um, I don't know how far there's going to be, it's going to be possible for the courts. I mean, the, ultimately the question will be one for the courts, but I'd have thought that, you know, an expert report would be pretty uh, decisive there. And if it's a joint, singly joint uh, instructed expert, then there's not going to be much room for arguing about it. But um, I mean, there may well be uh, room for arguing about it. And, you know, it, I guess it could get very technical if there are different experts instructed by each side. Um, so um, another thing that's interesting here uh, in this law is that, uh, and this is something again I was talking to Michael just before, there's no provision, uh, if, you, if we go back to section 9, there's nothing there that refers to any, um, any kind of, so th these are the, 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 the circumstances in which they don't have to carry out work, you know, if they can't get permission from a superior landlord, uh, for example, but there's nothing there which says, um, you know, that there's any kind of sort of excessive costs that they shouldn't have to bear, or that, um, you know, any kind of reasonableness test. I mean, I guess courts are always happy to, to impose a reasonableness test, but there's no limit. I mean, this is interesting. You know, I had a case recently, and um, the expert had identified a few things that he said, so basically installing a ventilator somewhere, installing a radiator somewhere else, and he said these were things that should be done to make the property fit for human habitation. But he then raised uh, the issue of um, cavity wall insulation and said, well, maybe if there isn't any cavity wall insulation, that would help. But he didn't sort of prescribe that as in, in a schedule of works. But, um, and, and the judge indicated, and I, I dealt with it by, by sticking it in the uh, list of things we wanted uh, the court to order anyway. But the judge sort of indicated, oh, well, I'm not going to do that because that would be expensive. But, you know, on the face of it, there's nothing really, if that would be in something which would make the property fit for human habitation, where it's currently not, as far as I can see, there's nothing that, 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 that imposes any kind of financial restriction on what can be done. Um, so, uh, so that's that. So um, anyway, I'm going to move on now. Um, Oh, there's a brief point here about um, uh, estimating the value of the claim. So, you know, on the when you file and serve a claim or a counterclaim, you have to obviously estimate the value of the claim and then pay a fee based on that. Um, there's two things to say. One is don't worry if you underestimate because you can apply to amend it later. But on the other hand, um, be aware, particularly if you're, if you're trying to in a, in a possession claim and you're trying to fend off a ground eight claim, if you underestimate to the extent that, uh, you know, there's a risk that the, you know, that even if you get everything you're asking for, you'll still be below ground eight. Um, you know, obviously, you know, don't say a figure that, that isn't realistic. Um, but don't, on the other hand, think, well, I just put in a low matter now, pay a small fee and we can always top it up later. Because, you know, I, I certainly had a case recently where we'd put in a figure and, and the judge said, well, it'd be an abuse. You, you, the strongest you're asking for, you can't, you can't now argue um, in response to the uh, landlord trying to um, get some repossession as a, an interim hearing. The judge said, you can't now argue that um, actually you're going to get more than that. You, you know, I'm going to take your claim at the strongest. At the strongest, you're still not going to beat ground eight. So, um, be wary of that. Um, so, um, counterclaims at the warrant stage. So this is uh, fairly straightforward. Um, you can uh, bring a counterclaim uh, right up to effectively the moment of execution. There's no problem with that. And if you're, 
is if it's a discretionary tenancy where the warrant can be, um, you know, where the court's got the power to repeatedly suspend uh, any warrant for possession, then you can argue that it's highly relevant to a decision to suspend a warrant um, if there's a, you know, a high value counterclaim that, that may reduce rent arrears. Um, the, when the court considers whether or not to add any counterclaim to the claim or whether to uh, ask it to be run separately, CPR uh, 20.9 applies. But um, in my experience, usually it's relatively straightforward to uh, persuade a court that you know, the, the two claims are bound up with each other in such a way that it should be added. Um, I'm not going to say much about retaliatory eviction because um, I've only got two minutes left and it really, uh, I've still not yet found a case uh, where it applies. So it's all set out in section 33 and 34 of the Deregulation Act. Um, then you see a complaint to the landlord, then a complaint to environmental health. And um, at some point along this path, there needs to be a section 21 notice. And then uh, also uh, there needs to be a service of either an improvement notice or a remedial notice. So um, those are the two documents that need to be served. Um, and if you need to know the exact uh, the exact framework, just look at the, the law. But um, limitation, there's just a couple of things I want to say really. Um, the first thing is that, um, it's worth bearing in mind because it's not always appreciated that well there's two things particularly worth bearing in mind one is that limitation is a defense so it only it has to be raised by the other side it's not something that we need to worry about and if they don't raise it tough you know if they, they forget to file a defense or they don't notice it tough uh, the second thing is is that if you're bringing a counterclaim and effectively you're asking for the disrepair to be offset against the rent arrears, then to the extent that it's an offset, it's effectively a, a, a request for equitable, uh, equitable relief. And equitable remedies are dealt with in Section 36 of the Limitation Act, and basically there's no time limit. So, you know, if you've got a counterclaim, there's no, there's no time limit at all. There's no limitation. You can uh, rely on you know, disrepair that that goes back to the 1970s, if you want to. Uh, that, that in principle, there's there's no time limit. Obviously, if you know, if you start to exceed the uh, level of arrears, then it's no longer an equitable remedy. It's then actually a claim. So, you know, it, it doesn't work that way. Um, notice. Uh, I mean, there's 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 a difference between um the kind of notice that's required um in under the section 11 and section 9a of the landlord and tenant act and the effective premises act i think the paper hasn't really uh, clarified that unfortunately um but um and there's also a, a difference if there's uh landlord the defective premises act has a provision that the landlord where the landlord ought to know uh, in particular, where the landlord's got a duty to um, carry out repairs, that effectively um, they can be effectively can be a kind of constructive notice. Uh, the thing about notice that I wanted to highlight, really, though, is that from the point of view of when the, when you meet the client, it's really really useful to actually get as much detail as you can at an early stage about the notice. So. Who did you speak to, or who did who did you see? When did you go there? You know, if you don't know exactly when, estimate. Um, what um, what did you say? What were you talking about? Were you, you know, it's not just a question. Notice for all the disrepair. Which issue did you raise with whom at what time? Um, had, knowing that and being able to specify that at an early stage makes a claim look much more credible uh, when the courts are considering it. Okay. Um, I better go. Uh, that's uh, my time up. So, Michael, over to you. Hello. Okay. So, um, my thing today is talking about um, Environmental Protection Act prosecutions 
in the magistrates court. Um, I've been banging on about these for a few years now. I think they we don't do enough of them. I, I would encourage solicitors to do more of it. Um, I think it has um, a number of substantial benefits um, for both the client and the solicitor. Um, the, the primary points being that invariably it results in works getting done and getting done promptly. It can be quite the trigger to that. Um, it invariably involves uh, results in compensation, albeit maybe not the full amount a client's entitled to, but some compensation for the client. And it gets a decent cost awards for the um, the lawyers that are involved. Now, a lot of people suggest have suggested to me, invariably, it tends to be the lawyers for the other side on these cases, for the landlords, that this is that these cases are just about ramping up costs for the tenants' lawyers. Um, but one that that's invariably caused by the way the landlords behave in cases where they are, are alleging that. Um, and while it can be lucrative for lawyers, um, it also gets works done and gets compensation for your clients promptly. Um, and equally, it's no bad thing for those of us who do a lot of legal aid work to be paid well for one because it's the only way we can really subsidize uh, um, the poor pay that we're getting in other fields. Um, um, particularly um, with um, things coming up on the horizon in relation to uh, um, the potential costs issues coming up in relation to fast track and multi-track cases um, and the concerns that we have on that field, EPA should be given a fresh look. I, I think that they're, they're not done enough. I think that the uh, um, the fitness for habitation provisions of the uh, 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 implied terms that have come in haven't been the the great uh, uh, um, the great haven't seen the great results that we were all hoping and expecting and indeed uh, as Rachel highlighted earlier we're we're having problems getting getting over the threshold of establishing that the property is not suitable um, to occupy as a consequence. Uh, um, whereas uh, I feel that establishing a statutory nuisance and pursuing a case uh, under the EPA is something that's still possible uh, um, and still feasible and can still get good results. Now, um, it's important to highlight as well, for those of you who are here who may not have gone near the EPA for a while or not done any EPA prosecutions ever before, um, one of the most important authorities um, on the on EPAs is Pairs House and Birmingham City Council. It should be included in any skeleton argument that you ever uh, um, seek to rely on in a case um, when you're representing a tenant because it emphasises that these proceedings should be a simple procedure for private citizens. I've put the quote at paragraph 56 of the notes, which um, I hope you've all got the link for and been able to download by now. Uh, um, um, this is Bingham, uh, um, uh, um, I think in the, the Court of Appeal at that point, saying, uh, um, um, it would frustrate the clear intention of Parliament if the procedure provided for by section 82 were to become bobbed down in unnecessary technicality, or undue literalism, it is important that the system should be operable by people who may be neither very sophisticated nor very articulate, and who may not, in some cases, unlike this appellant, have the benefit of specialised and high quality advice. Now, as somebody who is neither very sophisticated nor very articulate, I'm always very grateful for that quote, um, because it, it essentially it makes the point that these technical points that uh, invariably professional landlords try to run shouldn't be going anywhere. Uh, um, and despite this case being the leading authority on the point, uh, um, commercially minded landlords, such as local, invariably housing associations more so than local authorities, um, will try to raise technical and, uh, and literal arguments all the way through. Uh, uh, and the point is, stick to your guns. Uh, um, all they're actually doing is racking up their cost bill at the end of the day. Um, nine times out of 10, their, their arguments have have no legs at all uh, um, uh, and uh, authorities of a similar nature to Pairs House will back you up on that in relation to EPA prosecutions. So um, it's a simple procedure. It should be a simple procedure. Um, it can get good results and, and you can get good, 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 good consequences. I've summarized again at paragraph 57, uh, um, the, the, the pros um, uh, and, and I've spent a bit of time on that already. So I'm not gonna spend much more time on that. The only other thing that I would highlight is essentially provided you're conducting yourself properly and you're conducting the litigation um, consistent 
in a proper manner and not in a wasted costs esque manner. So, um, on, uh, in in such a poor manner that somebody would make a wasted cost order against you, you you and your client are to a large extent cost protected. There's no power for the court to order a prosecutor to pay costs to a defendant. If a defendant is successful, they're entitled to costs from central funds. So, um, so that's the only other benefit as well, which is worth noting. Um, in relation to disadvantages, there are some. I, I, I don't want to skim over them too much, but but um, it, it essentially um, they only arise where there's a statutory nuisance. So other elements of housing conditions uh, um, can't be covered by an EPA prosecution. You do have to prove your case beyond reasonable doubt. It's a higher threshold. It can be hard in circumstances, but I think provided you've got some solid expert evidence that that establishes the point. Um, you're very unlikely to not meet that threshold, um, particularly where the experts agree in any event. Um, and there can be criminal, uh, the, 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 the procedural rules um, uh, um, are more stringent and you need to just keep an eye on that um, as you're going through the, prop, through the case. And that can end up causing you to, to slip up technically because criminal procedure does have some technical elements, but provided uh, um, that you've got somebody on board who knows about criminal law, you should be be okay. So if you you want to, you know, second opinion from counsel who's who's got a criminal background as well as a housing background, that that's the way that you deal with that. It, it, and it's not that complicated, particularly in an EPA prosecution. Um, and I would return back to the point that I say about Pears House. These cases shouldn't fall down on on technicalities and pettifoggery. Um, there are strict disclosure obligations. Uh, um, on the tenant and no disclosure on obligations on the landlord and that can trump privilege so uh, um, if you've got privilege material that undermines your case then you may well have to disclose that or consider withdrawing the case um, and finally the costs awards can be limited they're no longer financially limited there's no longer a cap on it but the time for which the compensation can apply to is limited by the fact that essentially it's a summary offense um, i'll come to that like um, later as well and, and equally one of the disadvantages for most of the solicitors who i imagine are here is that there's no legal aid funding for that but the um as i say the the, the, the opportunity to recover the cost from the other side uh, um, ca uh, uh, commercial rates can be quite lucrative in that sense um when can you pursue a prosecution? It, essentially, um, you have to have a tenant that is aggrieved by a statutory nuisance, um, and you have to have a defendant who's the owner of the premises or responsible for the nuisance. I'll go into that in a little bit more detail shortly. Um, and before the tenant issued the proceedings, they gave the landlord notice specifying um, that they uh, that the matter of uh, specifying the matter complained of not less than 21 days um, uh, in writing of their intention to start proceedings. Um, I'll come to the notice requirements shortly as well, but it's essentially statutory nuisance can cover a large volume of things in a paragraph 59 of my notes. Um, I do list those, but um, essentially the I think I'm trying to check, but I think practically all of the cases I've ever done, I think indeed all of the cases I've ever done for a tenant, you are looking at, at 79A, which is any premises are in such a state as to be prejudicial to health or a nuisance. Um, and it's the prejudicial to health limb that you're gonna be heading down. Um, and um, that's, um, there are all these other areas that you can look at, but, I, in reality, it's going to be establishing prejudicial to health. You're nine times out of ten, these are these are damp cases, and it's mold that you're talking about. Um, the um, the issue of whether or not something is prejudicial to health is outside of the expertise of the tribunal. They have to have expert evidence, um, and it needs to be somebody who's suitably qualified. So it needs to be an environmental health officer or a surveyor with relevant qualifications. There is authority to the effect that a chartered surveyor is not good enough. Now, um, so you're looking for somebody who's got environmental health expertise, uh, and they do need to provide a report to that effect. Uh, um, the um, uh, in nine times out of 10 in the cases I've done it, the tenant has got it right, and they briefed an environmental health officer. And then the landlord has breached the chartered surveyor, um, which is ever so helpful because their evidence is going to be given less weight, uh, and in fact has less authority as a matter of law than uh, um, than an environmental health officer. So, um, but keep an eye, make sure you're instructing the right person at the start. Um, 
the focus when you're looking at the statue nuisance is the effect it's having rather than the cause of the nuisance itself. Um, clearly, it's still necessary to establish that the statue nuisance is caused by something of which the defendant is the owner or is responsible for. But um, this is a much more limited requirement um, than, um, than the, the where you are when you're in the civil courts and you're establishing a breach of contract. Indeed, a landlord can be responsible for a statutory nuisance without having breached any terms of the contract. Uh, um, so you don't need to get over uh, um, Section 11 or all the finished habitation provisions or anything like that. You just have to show that there is a statutory nuisance in the premises and the landlord is either the or, or the individual that you're prosecuting is either the owner of the premises, which I'll come to shortly, or, or a, a responsible in the sense that a default on their part has done that. And a default can be their failure to put in place an improvement, for example, moving the radiators to being under the windows, putting in extractor fans in the right places uh, um, <clears throat> um, a, a, and such the like. So putting in insulation, properly insulated walls and such the like or, or um, dry lining and things like that. So. Um, so that's the the focus is more so on on that than than looking for a breach, so to speak, of their responsibilities. You've got to focus on establishing the statute of nuisance. Um, where um, somebody is an owner of premises, it, essentially the individuals responsible under Section 82.4 can be quite broad and there can be multiple people who are responsible, including your client. Uh, um, uh, let's not forget the standard refrain where um, where we're complaining about mould and damp in a property is um, from the landlord as well. The tenant's been drying their towels on the radiators. They've been um, drying clothes inside. They've not been properly ventilating the property. They turned off. They've disconnected the extractor fan. All of that. Now, that is um, that can be relevant. And if they can establish that your client is wholly responsible, then um, then you do, they do have a defense, but they have to do that. They have to show that they're wholly responsible and not, as is normally the case, that they may well be contributing to it with some of their conduct, but that equally, if the premises were adjusted in a certain way, that would remedy the defects as well. That would address the problems with mold rising as well, um, because there can be multiple people responsible uh, um, and um, all of whom can be prosecuted. And, and, and the fact that somebody else is equally responsible does not mean that you have a defense to, um, to, uh, um, to a prosecution under the EPA. Um, the owner, for the purposes of part three of the Environmental Protection Act, um, is the person for the time being receiving the rack rent of the premises in connection with um, with the word um, is used, whether on his own account or as an agent or a trustee of any other person or who would so receive the rack rent if the premises were let at a rack rent. So essentially it's the person getting the market rate. Market rent is normally regarded as the owner. And so that would normally be your direct landlord. If there's a leaseholder and then a freeholder, uh, um, then then they the, the, the initial person would be the leaseholder. It may well be, however, that the freeholder is um, has some kind of responsibility as well. So it may well be, for example, in, in a block of flats that you've got a local authority who owns the property, a housing association that has the leasehold in the in the flat um, and you, your client is renting from them or a, a private landlord, for example. They may it may well be that you are prosecuting both the um, the leaseholder and the freeholder because the overall structure of the building, the the poor insulation on the outside of the building is one of the factors for which the um, the freeholder is responsible, and you equally may um, well have a claim against, and equally the leaseholder is responsible as the owner of the premises because they're receiving the rack rent, the market rent from you, and um, equally, um, and they equally have the ability to make adjustments in the property, for example, dry lining, um, putting in insulation, uh, sorry, uh, putting in uh, ventilation, uh, um, and adjusting the the heating provision. Um, so it may well be that you decide to go after numerous people. Invariably, it's helpful to do that, uh, um, at least initially, because uh, um, they then start flinging mud at each other rather than uh, back at you, uh, and you, you, you will end up eventually getting the right person, provided you've got sufficient evidence that would justify an action against either of them. It's probably advisable to go after both. Um, so that's they're the people, that's the, the, the people responsible or the owners that you need to think about. 
And as I highlight again at paragraph 67, where the tenants contributing to the nuisance by their own conduct, this does not amount to a defence for the landlord. So that, that is more helpful than, than what you sometimes experience in the county courts. Um, notice, um, when it comes to these proceedings, um, you do have to give notice to the other side 21 days before. Now, this can be quite a helpful tool in its own right, because it may well be that your client just wants them to do something about this and just wants them to get the work done. He doesn't he could care less about damages. He could care less about anything else. He just wants them to get the work done. And the threat of an EPA prosecution on 21 days notice um, with a sensible landlord should trigger them to get the, the environment, the, get the statute nuisance removed and get the works done that will abate it from recurring um, in the future as promptly as possible. Uh, um, so even if you're not necessarily inclined to go the whole way, um, I would advise if you're, um, if you have a standard letter for action, adding one simple paragraph to that letter for action that says, just as far as, just so you know, we're, this, we're also treating this as a notice pursuant to section 82 of the Environmental Protection Act. And upon this is your 21 days notice. And if no action is taken to remedy the defects, we will also uh, reserve the right to pursue a prosecution in the magistrate's court. Um, the, um, the notice <laughs> invariably can, be um, quite the litigation point for housing association landlords. Um, to date, it, 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 over the years of me doing these cases, I've never seen them successfully establish that a notice is not valid. And that's again down to the authorities on this. Um, the, um, the authorities are, are, are fearless. And again, you refer to Pears House as well. Um, essentially provided you've told the landlord ballpark what's going on at the property um, and said and if you don't do some uh, and said in 20 this is your 21 days notice before we go to magistrate school um, that's good enough um, and it doesn't need to be a technical document you're these as they always remind us in the authorities these are letters that should be able to be written by by lay individuals not litigants they don't need to have any expertise so it, it, they don't need to say oh it's damp being caused by x y and z you don't need an expert's report to serve a, a, a notice it just needs to say there's a problem at the property for, for, our, for our client, for the tenant, they are suffering X, Y, and Z. The, we have seen some, uh, uh, and, and that's about it. You can go into a little bit more detail. It doesn't harm to possibly put in some photographs of what you're looking at. It doesn't hurt to say, um, we, we suspect the damp is being caused by a big hole in the roof that we've seen. But, um, but equally, you're not bound by that. Uh, um, and you aren't required to go into such detail. It's essentially, there's a problem at the property in this ballpark area we want you to fix it here's your 21 days notice um and um if uh, and don't be worried if the other side raise an issue about the notice they uh, nine times out of ten they do do uh, um but i have not seen as i say uh, um, them successfully strike these things out um at least not to then be be, be then overturned by the high court but certainly in my, in my cases i've never had to even go that far they, they will that they, they, it's raised as a technical point, but again, as I say, the te technicalities and pedophagy shouldn't be of concern. Um, and again, I, I quote a series of authorities in paragraphs um, uh, from paragraph 68 through to 70, which deal with, with that point. So um, if it does come up, you've got all those authorities there to rely on. Um, it is advisable to include the stuff I provided at paragraph 71 of my notes, um, so the name of the talent, the details, the address of the premises, um, some kind of ballpark idea of what the problem is, and an unequivocal statement of an intent to pursue for a prosecution that expires over the period of notice, which is not less than 21 days. Um, the notice must be served on the person responsible or the owner as appropriate, but again, um, don't get too concerned about um, precisely who, particularly with the big corporations and with local authorities that can get technically quite complicated. Um, there is provision in section 160 for it to be served on the secretary or clerk of a, of a body. But um, the more recent authority of London Borough of Ealing and Allen reiterated the point that we shouldn't be getting stuck down in technicalities about it being served on the wrong individual or a body. Um, 
provided that so and has highlighted that the section 160 of the EPA is permissive rather than mandatory so provided that a notice is validly served uh, um, sorry is delivered or posted to the registered or principal place of business of the body corporate um, when addressed to that body um, without further identification then that will be a sufficient notice for the purposes of, of, of section uh, uh, section 82 um, but again it, um, it don't get too concerned about it make just worst case scenario if you if you think there are multiple different people who should be served with this at a relevant body just send it send copies of the letter to all of them um the um you then um once you've had your 21 days up and if nothing's actually happened Um, sorry, I just saw a question from Walata there on um, the Section 21 notice. Um, and sorry, the first, on the first, sorry, on the second question, because it seemed right on the, the point about what I was saying. Um, my view is it's not an abuse process, it's a separate proceedings. You're entitled to serve a Section 82 notice at any point, whether or not, sorry, Walata asks whether or not you can serve an 82 notice. Um, we, um, whether or not you've got civil proceedings ongoing um even if they've started progressing um my view is no you can you can serve a section 82 notice uh, um at any point um the the fact that the civil proceedings wouldn't make it an abusive process to do it in the, the criminal courts um invariably i know solicitors who have it as a standard paragraph on any letter before action which relates to civil proceedings but they also say oh by the way uh, um then we're going to pursue criminal proceedings i i don't see it being an abuse unless unless you've settled those civil proceedings and it deals with all the works that are concerned. I think there could then be issues, but, but I think it, it, with ongoing civil proceedings, I don't see a problem with you serving a sex trade notice and contemplating a, um, a, a EPA prosecution. Just looking at the earlier question you put. Yeah, we had, um, again, uh, well, after you talked about scenario where you had a surveyor who provided evidence and the court decided the evidence should have been given from a, an environmental health officer, that's exactly what I was saying. There is authority to the effect um, that if that if the individual doesn't have environmental health expertise, whether they're an environmental health officer or they're a surveyor with those additional uh, um, qualifications, then um, their evidence is is not going to be treated as sufficient for the court. Um, so um, anyway, moving on. Um, in relation to um, laying an information, um, until relatively recently, you had to, 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 to formally prepare an information. But now, rather helpfully, they, when they updated the criminal procedure rules, they provided a form that you fill out. Um, and I reference it and provide the link uh, in uh, my notes at paragraph 73. Um, and that meets all the requirements, of which there are quite a lot more now before you issue a prosecution, all kinds of statements that you need to make, all kinds of undertakings you need to give. Um, and it's important that, though, that you use that form. If you don't use that form, you're likely to find that your um, prosecution um, could be challenged later down the line and you could end up incurring a lot of costs um, that, that are then not recovered because the, um, the, uh, the court isn't able to proceed on that basis. Um, so, um, uh, and don't assume that if a court just carries on because you've sent them some paperwork but not the right paperwork that you're still good. Um, you, you need to make sure that form's put in at the start. Uh, um, otherwise, you may well be withdrawing your prosecution and starting over again, which you don't want to be doing. Um, because, and this is very important, at the stage when you lay the information, when you make this application, you want there to be evidence of a statute nuisance of the property. Because your costs on a Section 82 prosecution only arise if there was a statute nuisance at the time the information is laid, so at the time the application to the court is made. Um, if you haven't got a statute nuisance then, then you will not be entitled to your costs for proceedings. Um, if the statute nuisance is remedied after that, you would still be entitled to your costs, uh, um, but you need to make sure there is a statute nuisance at the point when you go and lay your information. So this is, and you're going to need to be able to establish that to the criminal standard. So this is where you will need to have some expert evidence. This is the first visit you're going to have from your expert. Um, you're going to um, send in your expert and you're going to want to know 
um, as quickly as possible from your export whether or not there's a statutory nuisance. And the minute that they tell you there's a statutory nuisance, you want to get that application into magistrate's court. What you don't want is a substantial delay between your expert evidence and your um, your application to the magistrate's court. Now that can be problematic with some experts. They're not they 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 may be prone to producing a report two or three weeks after the they've gone to visit the property. Um, but actually, the way of dealing with that, even with those experts, is to to call them up, to send them a letter saying, look, are you going to find in your report that the, 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 that this is a statutory nuisance case, that the, the, this property is prejudicial uh, um, to health? Um, if they say yes, then crack on and get your information. You don't need the expert's report at that point, but you do not want there to be a substantial delay between the expert's evidence and the, um, the, and the notice being laid, because every bit of delay is a possibility for something to change in the nature of the property that allows them to argue, well, actually, you can't be sure on the criminal standard that there was a statutory nuisance on the day the information was laid. Um, it may well be that it's a few days, uh, and that is quite common between that, those, two, those two steps, but you're going to want to check with your client on that day when you're putting it in, just contact your client and go, look, has anything changed since the expert gone in? Has anybody come and done any works? Has anything you know, drastic happened to the mold? You haven't done a, you haven't done a cleanup job, have you? Anything like that. Um, and um, uh, and make sure that you have that 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 situation so that you can be sure that there was statutory nuisance when you lodged the information. Um, so that's that's a paper process. You put that in, you lodge that with the court, and then they're going to list you. They're going to summons the uh, defendant or defendants, depending the landlords, and um, you're going to have a first hearing. Now, <clears throat> at the first hearing, essentially, that's that's your first first that's your standard first hearing in the magistrate's court, where either the defendants are going to plead. Um, plead guilty in which case you will be dealing with sentencing um, compensation or all, all of that or they're going to go uh, um, not guilty i have to say it's a lot more common for landlords to go not guilty because for you to get a, a criminal for them to get a criminal record you have to establish a statute nuisance at the date of the hearing and if they say not guilty at that point they still have until the trial to try and abate the nuisance um, to avoid getting that that criminal conviction and avoid being subject to a fine and compensation order um, so even if they aren't not guilty they will invariably say not guilty at that point to buy themselves some more time it's always worth um, canvassing with them beforehand, whether or not they are going to give an indication as to what their plea is going to be um, in the days before. So that if they are going to be pleading guilty, maybe you can uh, uh, you're prepared with submissions on sentencing and um, and your costs. You've got a cost schedule ready and such like, um, and your damages award as to how much you're asking for for in compensation. Um, they may well be willing to do that. Equally, um, they may well be willing to compromise the case provided that the prosecution is withdrawn. So they may be willing to agree a schedule of works, um, a, a series of a, a payment of damages to your client and your costs before that hearing. Uh, um, but again, invariably that tends to happen after they've entered the not, not guilty plea. But again, all things worth exploring um, as early as possible with the defendants to see if you can um, nip everything in the bud and save everybody a lot of money and time. Um, <clears throat> Um, if the case is uh, does go on a not guilty plea, then you're then going to be looking at case managing the case. Now, the magistrates court do have a standard form. Sorry, one second. Um, that they do that they use when somebody enters a not guilty plea um, called preparation for trial in the magistrates court. <clears throat> now, most of that form is not relevant to EPA prosecutions. It asks things like, will you be relying on DNA evidence? Are you going to um, put in your interview uh, um, as a transcript or will you be playing it and all these kinds of things which just have no correlation to EPA prosecutions um, and equally it's then missing the stuff that you want the defendant to address um, at that first first hearing so um, what I have done is sent out a draft of the form I like to use um, um, for everybody to have a look at obviously you may want to amend it yourself but what you want to do at that first hearing is firstly, um, throw your defendant's minded brain out, out, because a lot of us have done criminal defense work or will have been involved in criminal defense work in the past. And we, as defendants, hate those forms because they try to pin you down, they try to get you to make admissions, they try to get you to narrow your defense as early as possible and narrow the issues. Whereas um, a defendant invariably wants to exercise 
their right um, not to self-incriminate uh, um, and to keep everything open and um, essentially at the very least put the prosecution to proof on all matters um, and so um, instinctively um, those of us who've done that in the past may well be amenable to arguments from the defense oh well we don't really need to, to agree to these things now we don't really need to narrow this down at this point we're entitled to we're you know defendants to criminal proceedings we're entitled to, to hold back from making these points until the trial comes along um and so so you don't want to <laughs> kind of leave yourself open to those arguments um and be well aware that a judge is on your side for once if you if you're used to being the other side of that argument where your defense counsel in a criminal case judges kind of uh, almost bully you to try and make some admissions at that first hearing and uh, you are prosecuting now you're prosecuting a landlord and you're likely to have a judge helping you out at that first hearing saying well yes why can't you admit whether or not you're the owner you know whether you're the owner kind of thing so you want um to put those questions to them um in the form that i've i've put in there about whether or not you're admitting you're an owner whether or not you're challenging the validity of the notice because you want to narrow down as many of the issues as possible um at this stage and um and a judge will support you and equally even if the judge doesn't support you and even if they just strike a line through those um admissions or, or denials that you've put in there as questions um when it comes to costs later down the line and they say, oh, well, this was unreasonable for them to have put in all this evidence and all these points dealing with all of this stuff. It's very simple for, for, the, for you then as a prosecutor to go back and say, well, we had to because they refused to narrow the issues when they should have done on the form. They refused to make any admissions. We had to prove every element. We had to incur these costs. We had to uh, um, do all this work. Um, and it's entirely justified on that basis. Um, so... Um, try your best to get them to narrow the issues uh, um, uh, on the form. Equally, if they are taking technical points, you want to get them to um, list those for preliminary hearings because the final trial is, is probably one of your most expensive parts uh, um, of the proceedings. Um, not so much for instructing counsel or solicitors because you're both operating, well, solicitors, obviously your, your own firm so is your cost, but you're, you're working on a CFA uh, um, and your counsel should be working on a CFA. Um, but you can't have your surveyor working on a CFA because of his duties to the court. So you will have to outlay for the surveyor to go and visit the property just before the trial. Um, what you don't want is to do all that work, pay for that surveyor, have the trial and then get kicked out on some small technicality about the notice or something like that. Um, you prefer to get those issues dealt with at a preliminary hearing. Um, invariably, you're going to win on it anyway, as I said before, but um, you want to get them listed for a preliminary hearing. If there's any issue with the notice, if there's any issue around ownership, if there's any issue around technical points, um, invite the court to list that for a preliminary hearing first. Also, when you're doing that, invite the claimant who's raising those issues to have to put in a skeleton argument on those issues first. Nine times out of 10, what that will actually mean is that A, you don't ever get see a skeleton argument and B, you don't even get to the hearing because what happens nine times out of 10 is they say, we're taking these preliminary points. They then get to the point where they've got to brief counsel to draft a skeleton argument for the landlord and they realize it costs some money and actually it's a stupid point in the first place. So they invariably drop the point uh, um, and make the admission at that point by way of a section 10 admission they are the owners they do accept the validity of the set of the the notice um and, and such like so that you can then go into the trial a lot smoother you've cut away a lot of the you've narrowed down a lot of the issues and you're focusing in then purely possibly on on the expert evidence that you're going to get that week um of the trial that's another thing that's important to do as well at this stage at that first hearing you want directions for the expert evidence you're not entitled to just get expert evidence and turn up on the day of trial with additional expert evidence. Um, um, judges in criminal courts do not like people turning up at the last minute with um, evidence that they haven't had permission for. Um, but you absolutely need expert evidence. If the nuisance is still ongoing, that is, then you need expert evidence or, or it's been cleared up, but it's going to come back. Um, you need um, an expert to attend immediately before the trial because it's on the date of the trial that you need to establish a statute of nuisance to be able to get the abatement order. So um, you will want a direction um, for experts to attend um, and you're going to want to fix the dates for all of these. So you're going to need your dates to avoid at that hearing. So you're going to want to fix your trial. You're going to get given your trial date by the magistrate's court. You're then going to say, well, at some point in that week before, we want our experts to be able to attend on this date. Um, their expert will attend as well. 
will narrow equally directions for the issues to be narrowed down between the experts. So hopefully by the day of trial, you'll have a joint um, a joint report from the experts saying, actually, we agree there's a statute of nuisance, there's some dispute about this, this and that, but, um, and you may well not have to go to trial because matters, matters can be settled. Or equally, your experts may be in agreement that there is no longer a statute of nuisance and therefore your issue may well be focused down purely to cost by that point. But um, it, again, it narrows the issues, but, but, but you do need those directions. You, you're not going to be able to just turn up on the day with, um, with um, additional expert evidence close to the trial without having got permission from the court for that first. Um, so, um, just moving on through my notes, um, as I say, when you come to the trial, you're going to be wanting to establish your statute of nuisance, so you need your expert there, and you'll need your expert to have gone in just beforehand. Um, um, be aware as you're going through that there are substantially uh, more complex rules around bad character evidence um, and hearsay evidence. So you may well be wanting to just exhibit documents or records or emails of things. Again, look at the rules. Are you going to be able to do that? Do you need to make a hearsay application? Um, do you want to refer to the fact that this housing association is particularly prone to being prosecuted and convicted of EPA prosecutions? You may well want to do that. Um, so um uh if you've if you've if you're regularly doing these you'll get to a point where you know that a particular landlord um a professional landlord has been subject to orders in the past and has and that is bad character evidence and you're entitled to rely on that um, uh, um and there's good reason to rely on that to show this isn't just a one-off these people are at it all the time um uh, and they're not coming to you with very clean hands at all um i just saw a question come in there i'm just going to quickly look at it yeah yeah that is correct um sorry julia was asking um whether we you want to get the expert out twice yes if the stat if they haven't come and sorted out as far as your clients concerned if they haven't come and sorted out the statutory nuisance then you're gonna need the expert to go a second time it may well be before the this is before the trial you need the one to be there before you lay the information so you need the expert then and then, uh, or as close to the information as possible. And then if this such nuisance is ongoing or works haven't been done, so it's gonna come back, you're gonna want the expert evidence before the trial. Now, if you've got a scenario where substantial, where you lay the information when there's a statutory nuisance, but then the landlord does get their act into gear and behave themselves, which is the advisable course of action for any landlord facing these prosecutions. I appreciate I've been, seen, been kind of focusing this talk more at those who represent tenants but for anybody who's here on behalf of a landlord i would always advise get the works done bring an end to proceedings as quickly as possible that's the way to resolve these cases so if a landlord is sensible and has done the works there may still be an issue outstanding around costs by the time of the trial but it may well be that your client says Do you know what they've put in some great extractor fans they've uh, redone the central heating the place is great I'm even wash drying my stuff inside and there's still never any mold anymore. It's all, it's a completely different property. I mean, obviously that's, you know, at the highest level, but you may get something from your client saying, look, as far as I'm concerned, the problem's been solved by their works. So I'm happy with the situation. You may not need, you may not then be instructing the experts to go in because you may just be saying, well, actually fine, we accept that. We accept that necessary works have been done to satisfactory standards. Um, and as a consequence, what we're only asking for now is the cost of these proceedings. Um, at that point, um, and I'll come to this slightly uh, um, later, your, your, the, the, the issue in the proceedings becomes narrowed substantially down to whether there was a such nuisance at the date that the information was laid. Um, you're equally in a position where your client can't get compensation. Um, as a matter of law, by order of the court, because um, the court can only order compensation if they find the offence is proven at the time of the trial. That doesn't mean, however, that your client can't get compensation um, by other means, because it may well be that you um, you issued the action on a letter before action, um, you're, you served your notice and it was part of a letter before action, you may have started civil proceedings, you may not have even got around to civil proceedings, you may never be thinking of even bothering with civil proceedings. But as far as the landlord is concerned, they don't know that. Uh, um, and there's every reason to try at this juncture, even if they've done all the works dealt with it and say, yeah, okay, that's fine, but actually you left this property in a right state for you know months or years, um, and our client, even if we 
settle these proceedings, our client has got lots of evidence that we will rely on in civil proceedings. Uh, um, and we'd invite you, therefore, to make a proposition to settle the whole lot, including a damages award for our client, some compensation for our client. Um, and with the pressure of ongoing criminal proceedings, you can find that you can get some good results that way without even having to bother start drafting a particulars of claim. Uh, and it may be that you're in a position that you, you weren't even going to do that, but they don't know that. Uh, um, and it can tactically get you into position where your client gets some damages where they may not have been able to, whether because legal aid funding wasn't available for that, whether because you don't do um, civil work on a CFA in, in the county courts, because obviously there's the, there's the costs issues and the, the lack of cost protection and all of that. It can, you can still get some kind of compensation for your client, even if you get to the point where you're not going to, the court won't be able to order it necessarily in the magistrate's court. Um, just going through my notes again, um, as I highlighted before, um, with them being criminal, you'll remember that your um, <clears throat> your disclosure obligations are higher and trump um, that um, privilege can be trumped. Um, equally, there's a realistic prospect that all the witnesses will be required to attend and all the witnesses will be able to give both their evidence in chief and their cross-examination orally. I have to say, albeit that there's a prospect of that, if you've got nicely prepared bundles with nicely typed out witness statements, um, um, most judges and the other side will invariably agree to treat their witness statements as their evidence in chief, much in the same way as you do in civil proceedings. Uh, um, in fact, um, I've not known a case not to go that way, but prepare, be prepared for the fact that a judge may say, no, actually, these are criminal proceedings. You have to give your evidence in chief and prepare your client for that as well. Um, but normally can be done on the basis that evidence is tendered uh, on the papers. Um, remember that a defendant may be denying all elements of the case. So if you get to half time, i.e. if you get to closing your case and you haven't proved, for example, that they're the owner of the property because you didn't bother to print off a land registry entry that showed they're a leaseholder or a freeholder of that land, then or you didn't exhibit the tenancy agreement or, or things like that to, to the to, uh, and get that in as evidence you could end up falling down on a technicality so make sure you've dotted the i's and dotted all the t's uh, and crossed all the t's sorry um because if not you could get kicked out half time on a very small kind of uh minor point that you you failed to address um <clears throat> Equally, make sure you're ready to go on the first day of trial. There are very strict rules about prosecutors being allowed to adjourn off cases. If you haven't got your witnesses and your experts there for the date, then you're going to want to be applying well before the trial date to deal with that. Uh, um, it's unlikely you're going to get the German unless there's some very good reason why it's been being made at the last minute if people don't turn up. Um, turning then, I'm aware that I've used up most of my time, I think, in fact, all of my time. But um, looking at remedies, um, essentially, you're going to be looking at getting a court cool order if the stack news is still ongoing for them to do the works. Um, and um, normally, you'll be essentially asking for the court to order that they do the works as contained in the schedule to your experts report. Um, it may be that there are two experts report and there's a bit of toing and froing about agreeing precisely what the works are. You're going to want to make sure it's clear about by what date this needs to be done. Um, equally, the court is going to impose a fine on the um, landlord. But what you're going to want to say is actually, we're firstly, bear in mind you're a prosecutor and it's not your obligation to kind of ramp up the fine as much as possible. It's purely to provide guidance to the court and assistance to the court. So don't be too vociferous in trying to push up the fine. Having said that, um, what you may want to say is actually we, we care less about the fine um, and indeed would have no issue with you reducing the fine provided that our client gets a decent compensation award. Um, so um, focus more on the compensation, which obviously you're entitled to do. Um, if, as I said, if there's no comp conviction, then you um, uh, aren't able to get compensation. But if there is, and if there is an order made, then you are. Um, you're um, going to want evidence about the effect that this has had on your clients already in the evidence. Um, and um, remember that compensation in the criminal courts is not just for the prosecutor. It's not, you know, in, in a normal criminal case, it's not the CPS who gets the compensation. It's, it's the victims of the crime. So 
it may well be that your client has um, pursued the prosecution, but she may have a partner, she may have housemates, or, or she may have children. Uh, um, there may be a whole array of people who've been affected by this conduct. Um, and each and every one of them is entitled to a compensation order if you can provide the evidence to demonstrate that. So um, don't hesitate to say, well, okay, she's entitled to a few thousand pounds for the condition of her home, but equally so is her son, so is her daughter. Uh, and that's one way of getting around the limited uh, um, time frame to which it does apply because um, the compensation award can only be made, uh, can only apply to the point when the offence arose. And in the context of an EPA prosecution, that's after the 21 day notice has expired. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and even then, it's um, capped at six months prior to the information being laid. So if you made a 21 day notice warning and then waited a year before issuing the, the, the prosecution, um, you would only be able to claim back for the six months prior to the information being laid. Um, I mean, they, the magistrates do a good job of dragging these cases out. So you can invariably end up seeking compensation for a year and a half, two years, but you are time limited from when um, the, 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 the 21 day notice expired. Um, the amount of compensation has been unlimited since the 11th of December 2013. A lot of lawyers forget this. Um, I've, I still see people arguing in the magistrate's court to this day, oh, well, we're capped at £5,000 for compensation. That's just not true. Um, and don't let anybody argue that. Um, highlight to them that that's been, a, been, been untrue since 2013. Um, so you can get as much as you want. But as a consequence of it only being the case since 2013, there's limited authorities for big, big rewards out there um, available. Though have a look in lag, see what's going on. Um, it's worth referencing how much the rent was if your client was paying a high amount of rent, um, but you do need to try and keep claims compensation awards simple. Um, magistrates courts don't like complex arguments about percentages and things like that. But if you say, look, she was paying X rent for a year and she had was suffering with this, and I think she should be entitled to at least this by way of compensation, then they're going to be open to um, something in that regard. Um, equally, you may want to look at some other measure of, of the impact it's had on them. Uh, um, there isn't any broad kind of defining shine or something like that in these cases. It's a very broad brush approach. If you can find an argument that justifies the amount you're claiming, then, then go for it. <clears throat> you do want to make sure if you are planning on pursuing civil proceedings or you have ongoing civil proceedings that are separate um, and that, that would still result in a separate award of damages, then you want to make sure that any court order that's made is very clear about for what period that compensation covers so that you're not accused of double claiming in the, the county court. Um, and then finally, just quickly, dealing with costs. Um, Section 82 provides its own statutory regime for the recovery of costs. It requires um, the defendant to pay the person bringing the proceeding such amount as the court considers reasonably sufficient to compensate him for any expenses properly incurred by him in the proceedings. Um, my view is, albeit unfortunately not so heavily backed up by authority, recent authority in particular, um, is that it's arguable that that determination of costs is equivalent to the indemnity cost basis, because it's about costs having been reasonably, reasonably sufficient to compensate somebody. Um, there is no mention of proportionality. And in my view, uh, and indeed the provisions that are provided for in the criminal procedure rules that talk about proportionality don't apply to this cost assessment. Uh, and arguably that's quite correct because how can a cost award in a case where essentially what you're seeking is an order for them to do works how do you have that proportionate balance do you look at the value of the works do you look at the the the, the cost to do the work do you look at the um, loss of amenity in the property it gets very co confused more so when you bear in mind that the com any compensation award is capped by virtue of the time limits um, rather than the effect it's had on this person potentially for years so um and and I certainly argue this point, and the courts uh, are open to that argument as well, that it shouldn't be unduly focused on quite what damages or fines been 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 made, and the proportionality is only by analogy. Um, there's a rather unhelpful case out there called um, Notting Hill Genesis and Camberwell Green Magistrates Court. Should be emphasised from the outset that the only person at the High Court on that case was the representative for the landlord, the um, 
the defendant in the case was the magistrate's court. They didn't send anybody. The um, interested parties would normally have been the representative for the tenant. They didn't send anybody. So the um, representative for the landlord had a bit of a run of the high court. It wasn't a contested case. Um, and um, the observations that are made by Subsequent Jane in that case um, are unhelpful, but can be distinguished on that basis, in my view. It's not a, a, a properly contested judgment. Um, he makes two observations which can be prob problematic. He talked about the fact that proportionality could be, uh, would be appropriate. I um, mean, he also talks about the use of and billing for a grade A fee and it ought to have been considered properly and addressed by the magistrates court, given that these cases could just be run by paralegals. Now, um, no offense to any paralegals out there. Uh, um, I'm sure there are some, uh, um, uh, well-qualified paralegals who could run these cases. Um, but but the, the, the point in a lot of these cases is nine times out of 10, if you're against a housing association, is that they do instruct grade A fee earners. They do instruct exceptionally qualified counsel to oppose the, the cases. Um, and it's entirely proper for you as a prosecutor to have equality of arms and to work on the case as a grade A fee earner and to instruct suitably qualified and experienced counsel to, to um, properly prosecute the case. Um, and that's the response to that argument. Um, and further clarification on more recent authorities helps us with that. Um, the case of Taylor and another and Burton um, is a much more reliable case where matters were contested. Um, the um, Justice Collins Rice in that case um, went on to say, um, this is a summary process. It's not proper parties going to significant lengths and expense in litigation, like litigating the quantum of costs, nor is it at all incumbent on the magistrates to deliver reasoned judgments on compensation or, um, or costs um, to be subjected to unrealistic, oppressive, needless standards of point by point analysis. Um, and goes on to highlight that the point about proportionality is that they are just analogies. Uh, um, that section 8212 is its own statutory mechanism for the payment of costs uh, um, and that the test is that which is contained therein. Um, more recently, again, um, Fordham, uh, sorry, Mr. Justice Fordham in the High Court um, provided a particularly helpful uh, um, um, judgment. This was in a case where essentially a magistrate had approached the cost issue as though they were prosecuting a um, uh, speeding fine or something or uh, or some petty theft said oh cost prosecution costs 100 pounds uh, and the prosecutor objected and drew attention to 8212 and made lengthy submissions and he said well well done you tried hard but prosecution costs 100 pounds their bill was 15,000 pounds um, one of the defendants had settled out and agreed to pay 4,500 pounds of that those 15,000 pounds um um, Mr. Justice Fordham quite helpfully, robustly says that was an inappropriate approach. You have to look at the section 8212 and the questions that are being posed by section 212 are those three questions that I've um, that I've provided for at um, at uh, I think it's paragraph 94 of my uh, my notes. Yeah, it is. Um, um, the the three questions uh, and certainly one thing that is entirely irrelevant is the financial. Um, financial situation of the defendant so their means is not relevant to whether an order should be made it's only relevant to enforcement at a later stage um, the first question is what expenses were properly incurred so were steps taken that shouldn't have been taken if so they're not going to get paid for but provided they were taken and they should have been taken then you're entitled to the cost for that is the amount reasonably sufficient to compensate the private prosecutor that's where you're most likely to see some debate well why are they charging an hourly rate why have they used grade a fee and that's all the stuff that we've dealt with before um, on cost debates but essentially you should be entitled to costs that have been properly incurred um and then um the final question is um if there's more than one defendant responsible, how should they be allocated between them? There's no, um, and, and the, it, the important thing about reasonably sufficient to compensate um, is, is in the context of properly incurred expenses. Um, it, it's not, um, it's not it's, so it's focused on the sufficiency of, those, of the money to, to deal with those expenses. It's not a broader kind of reasonable costs assessment. It's, is it reasonably sufficient? So the focus is on, on, on the actual costs incurred and, and what should be paid for that. Um, so, um, so don't be too scared. The other side will try to raise arguments on this again, particularly if they're from a housing association, but you should be entitled to your, your cost and you should be entitled to a substantial award of costs. Um, it, it's uh, entirely proper for you to be billing your commercial rates on a CFA. 
Um, so um, you should um, be looking at substantial costs awards um, in cases of this nature. Um, it's not unheard of for the costs awards to go into um, tens of thousands of pounds. Um, it's not unheard of for costs awards for merely the first appearance um, to, to go to figures in exceeding, uh, exceeding 5,000 um, pounds. So you are entitled to be properly paid for your work on these cases. Uh, um, and you, invariably you will recover them um, unless provided you've brought the right authorities to the, to the court's attention. Um, another argument that I've recently seen being raised, which I deal with in paragraph 95, is some argument that you're only liable for costs in the proceeding. So they, the, 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 the defendants try and knock out any investigatory costs, which would also include your initial briefing of your um, surveyor. Um, for that very reason, it's, it's just got to be flawed. Um, there are authorities that, that make it clear that that's flawed. One deals with the Environmental Protection Act and how you're entitled to the cost of your investigation. Unfortunately, it's a different part of the Environmental Protection Act. Another authority deals with the precise wording in the proceedings on a different piece of statute, but makes it clear that the investigatory costs are, are recoverable on private prosecutions. Um, I, I, I was against somebody on this issue uh, um, uh, a few months ago, and her first point when I relied on the first authority was, well, this authority deals with different wording. It doesn't deal with the words in the proceedings. And then when it came to the authority that deals with the word in the proceedings, she responded by saying, but it, um, it, uh, uh, um, it doesn't relate to the Environmental Protection Act. Well, hang on, the, the first authority related to the Environmental Protection Act. The, you know, you've clearly got a full lock as far as I'm concerned, and it's a silly argument and, and should be rapidly dealt with it on that basis. Um, um, there are, as I say, at paragraph 96, there's these arguments around um, grade A fee earners being uh, uh, briefed and um, expert counsel being briefed. And um, again, um, the more recent authority um, uh, from Fordham helps in that case. He recognizes that um, it's likely to be reasonable for prosecutors to instruct expert high grade lawyers when facing a deep pocketed defendant who's instructing very expensive lawyers themselves. Um, and this can be helpful, particularly in cases when they see your cost schedule. Sometimes defendants will put in equivalently large cost schedules and then object about your cost schedule. Well, hang on. Or the, the alternative is they don't put any cost schedule and say, well, we're not happy that they're briefing counsel of um, 10 years call to which norm, it's not uncommon for the bench to query, well, what, what's your call to the person who's opposing? And invariably it's, it's the same, if not higher. Um, it, uh, and a really helpful authority is the case of Felwell, where the, the um, Lord Chief Justice at the time uh, observed that it's a welcome feature of these cases that the courts often make substantial orders against defendants for the recovery of investigative costs and costs that might have to be incurred to ensure equality of arms before a trial judge. So you should get well paid. Um, <clears throat> Um, and then finally, in relation to costs, risks for you and your client, um, it's only if there's a wasted cost order threshold made, which is quite a hard threshold for them to get over that you should be subject to any cost. Of course, be aware you're pursuing a criminal prosecution, you have broader duties and obligations, but provided you meet those, you're, you shouldn't, shouldn't be subject to cost, cost awards against yourself. Um, equally, the CFA should not have a success fee in it. If it does, then it's... Um, <clears throat> then it's going to be found unlawful and that could be a basis for challenging your cost order. Um, and then finally, very quickly, um, if the landlord fails to then comply with the order that's made, you can then bring them back and enforce against them. And the most significant part about that is that if they are convicted on that, which is a lot easier to prove because it's just proving that they didn't comply with the order, you don't need to keep on getting the expert back for trial. It's just that a month later they hadn't done the work. Um, if they're found guilty on that, then they um, do end up getting hit with a fine and an ongoing fine of 50 pounds per day. Um, so that really will turn the screws on a landlord to make sure they get, get the case done. I have to say, this is exceptionally rare um, in my years of practice, I've not seen a landlord fail to act once the order's been made, apart from in one case. Um, and um, it was a very expensive day for that landlord um, when they did. The, the courts were not happy at all. Um, <laughs> I'm just getting notes from, from somebody on, on, on my thing. I, 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 I I've put fifty pounds per day in my my. In, I said fifty pounds per day just now. Um, I think I was looking this up just before. It may be five hundred pounds per day. I couldn't work out how I. In the past, I thought it was five hundred pounds per day, but in my haste to be ready for the seminar, I hadn't quite pinned down where I'd got that figure from. It may have been that I'd missed 
no hang on it is no it is it's it is 500 pounds a day because that's one tenth for five thousand pounds isn't it sorry my maths was wrong this this afternoon before I, before i came in um so it's not 50 pounds a day it's 500 pounds a day that's right isn't it phil am i right my maths one tenth for five thousand yeah um thanks thanks for the commentary from my, my instructing solicitor who brought that to my attention separate there but there we go um um so yeah 500 pounds a day so it really does turn the screws um uh, clearly that in that scenario a landlord's going to be quite keen to settle and get things resolved quite quickly um the defendant does have a right of appeal as is standard in the magistrates court they can go and have a rehearing in the crown court but the relevant date for that appeal will be the date when the trial happened in the magistrates court so you wouldn't need to get the expert to go back to the property again in the, the crown court you'd still rely on the same evidence you had below um though used to be in the old lag book it used to say that the, the prosecutor also had an equivalent right of appeal to a rehearing um, that since I, I i don't know where that came from and, and and my paragraph 102 deals with why i think that's wrong and actually it's disappeared from the more recent lag book on housing conditions so i think that was just an error in the old lag book um uh and obviously all parties have the right to pursue case stated or judicial review um and there we go. Um, equally, the lo local authority does have powers under the EPA. You may want to get them to go in initially just to get an environmental health officer to give you a report on the cheap. Because if you get an environmental health officer's report that there's a statute nuisance, even if the local authority don't prosecute, you could potentially rely on that to lay on information provided you act promptly. Um, but there you go. Anyway, um, I've run over by 15 minutes. Um, apologies for that. Um, are there any more questions okay i don't think so if there are any more questions please put them in the chat or in the questions and answer section um there is a feedback form um which we would be really grateful if you filled out um but i don't have the link immediately to hand which is quite annoying um phil i don't suppose you have the link to hand i'm afraid i don't i mean if people want to talk Sort of using their voices can we just enable everyone to talk if they want to i'm, I'm not sure i'm able to do that but okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're still floundering here well anyway i think it's going to have to be chat then if anyone has any more things they want to talk about i mean i can if somebody puts up their hand i can allow them to talk so that is something but um but yeah it's looking like um we are where we are um it may well be that we don't i'm i'm, I'm trying to get unfortunately i closed down teams because it ground i think natalie just um, posted the um the excellent feedback. thank you Thanks, natalie. natalie that's really helpful so yeah if you see the form there if you could um it would be really helpful for us to get the feedback so and, it, and it's a very quick form it's a kind of a tick box exercise it shouldn't take more than a minute or so to do um if you could do that great now um oh hang on yeah we have to share it sorry it's just been given to us by natalie i'll put it in the chat to everybody now um if you could just click on that and go and do that straight away that would be really helpful um um while the while strike while the iron's hot so to speak um we'd be very appreciative you can tell us how terrible we are if you want to as well in there I mean, uh, and you can do it anonymously if you want to as well um i think I don't know but anyway or you could pretend to be somebody else and be offensive that's fine as well um uh yeah it looks like um no further queries or questions but um okay. i can't see anything coming up no nothing else coming up well um thank, thank you everybody for coming thank you oh. turning on <laughs> okay well, should we go? How yeah, I suppose. You, we all um, just you, you, you didn't have any questions, Phil, did you? <laughs> no, no, I don't have any questions. I find it very interesting myself. All right. Good. Excellent. All right. Okay. Thank you every ever so much, everybody. Um, I hope you had a good afternoon and um, have a good evening, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.